Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ricardo Grassi. Who are you? Uh, I'm Marco Grubenik, right? Uh, Hello, Marco. Hi. Nice. Hi, hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> yeah, good, good. So yesterday, sorry for uh, late uh, no, response. No, don't worry, don't worry. Fine. No problem. No problem. No problem. We have the to day... wait until 11.20, yeah? Yeah. Ah, 11.20, OK. Um, so uh, uh, can, can can you just tell me about what's the format of the event? So first, we have some uh, yeah, this short is presentations. A, this, is a, this is a workshop, no? They call it like yeah. that. So. Each of us will make a, a, a short in introduction, like like points, you know, considering mm -hmm. that afterwards there would be questions and answers to each one of us. Hmm? So okay. in this introduction, we should not go beyond four minutes each. Hmm? Is it okay if I show a couple of slides in these four minutes? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, your, your part, I mean, there's another, technological person, which is a Swedish guy called Fabian Sidner. Oh, you mean me, Ricardo? Oh, hello, you're there. <laughs> Good morning. How Good morning, you? you all. We all arrive early. I mean, he's uh, Marco. And, hello, Marco. Uh, Hi. So Marco, where are you guys based out of? Oh, uh, Slovenia, Ljubljana. Slovenia. Uh, yeah, uh, and you are what, Stockholm or? Yeah, exactly, exactly. We're Stockholm, but we also have uh, stuff in Florence. Oh, okay. And Ricardo is from where? From... from? I'm from Argentina, from Buenos Aires, but I'm in Rome. I live in Rome, yes. Oh, really? Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see you still have nice temperatures down there. Mm. You've been there? Oh, in Rome, yeah. Many, wow. many times. Yeah. Buenos Aires. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, Buenos Aires, no, no. I was many times in Brazil, but never managed to get to Buenos Aires. Oh, but Brazil is so good. It's good enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be. I lived there one year in Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, yeah Rio, yeah. But I've been here for many, many years. Huh? I, uh, in one of those situations, I, I had to leave Argentina and then life continued here. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Well, Rome is a nice place also to live, I guess. Mm. Of course, of course. And it's so warm now. I mean, it's yeah. so warm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Fabian, we have at uh, the beginning, uh, uh, because the format of this is a workshop, no? So we, we make each of us uh, an introduction, uh, brief, not more than four minutes, and then there should be questions uh, uh, to each one of us and uh, from the attendees. If there are no questions between Banu and I, we will put uh, make questions to each We'll one. just chat. We'll just chat about good things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So let's see. Hmm? And of course, hello, Bono. Hello, Asher. Nice to meet you both. Ah, hello. Yeah. So who's is, only Martina is missing? She, no, we have Martina as well. Everyone is here. Yeah. <laughs> what is Martina? I Martina is, you know. <laughs> yeah, although I have to say, Martina, I haven't been to that part of Stockholm yet. <laughs> I don't know where it's it is, but it's beautiful. Can you please take me there? It's very nice. It's where TV's office is. We are very fortunate. Uh, oh, well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And Banu Hokan says hi, our mutual friend, my colleague. Yes. Oh, yes. Hi. I'm just enough to say hi back to him. <laughs> okay. I will. So. Good. Now, and Marco, where are you? You you uh, are taking us to uh, new heights. Yes, uh, <laughs> he's somewhere in the space. Uh, 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 no, I have even better. Actually, this is uh, recently I got this photo. This was made by Hub, uh, Hubble, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And this was eleven days of exposition, and it's it's not calculated. It's it's mm -hmm. actually made right by Hubble. Uh, beautiful. 
So this mm -hmm. was one of these recent important photos from Hubble. Yeah. Mm. And Bano, you have the traditional one, right? I have the traditional one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ay, Banu, Banu. <laughs> Mm. Um, uh, one of the things, you know, um, these sessions are recorded and uh, there will be a session summary which will be presented to Chief Executive Board and it will also mm -hmm. go toward the Internet Governance Forum. So right now, you know, if you see that, you know, there, there is uh, the sessions are very thinly participated. I'm attending another one as well, which is also very thinly participated. There are about, you know, 10 odd people, you know, like... Uh, watching the video on YouTube because this is also being um, broadcasted live on, on YouTube. So even if it is like that, don't worry about it because you know, like what will come out of it, it will go, you know, like uh, a, a lot far, further from, from, from here. So let us keep but, that in our uh, uh, Would we be able to get the, the recording? I mean- Yes, yes, yes. Uh, what I will do is that as soon as you know we will have it, uh, I'll, I'll send a copy, a link of that one uh, to you. Ricardo. Yeah, because I want to uh, put it in the in the platform. No. Okay. All right. Okay. It's, uh, platform. Yeah. So uh, what I suggest is um, I suggest that you know each of us uh, take about five minutes and um, yeah, and then uh, after that five I'm, minutes is good. I'm saying four, but because I mean. Let's say the format is a workshop, no? So we, we introduce so you, some points and then hoping that there will be questions. Right. Otherwise, we start questioning each other, no? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, but now, when do we start? Do we have to wait for the uh, organizers to say something or? Or not? Banu. Um, I think you know, we'll start in four minutes and it's uh, 11 16. Here it is, Here it is uh, uh, Lily. Lily uh, sent a message. Mm. Oh, okay. They want us to start right away? Yes, uh, good morning from Ghana. Uh, the session starts at 10 20, so in four minutes you can start. It's 10, 10 20 my time, which is UTC. And um, your technical aid together with Alicia. Spostini and we'll be on a session. Good morning, enjoy the session. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Lily, thank, thank you very much. So uh, we start. Mm -hmm. uh, good, so I open the, the situation. Hello to, to everyone. Hello to all and to each one. Uh, my name is Ricardo Grassi. I'm a journalist, an author, an organizer. I'm from Argentina, but I'm living in Rome since many years. So, uh, and I'm the director general and the head of editorial policy of an organization, an independent organization, civil society organization called Citizens. It's an initiative called Citizens Platform on Climate Change and Sustainable World. Uh, we are working together with uh, uh, UNESCO and in particular with uh, Banu Neupane, who will start today's meeting. Uh, I want to thank very much to the uh, Internet Governance Forum for accepting our proposal for the, for the workshop, I mean, submitted by UNESCO and Citizens Platform. And to also, I want to thank each one of the, those that have registered to, to attend this workshop, plus our speakers. Um, we wanted very much to, to consider in this context the climate change disinformation, and we uh, add to this a double perspective, which is trying to go beyond confusion created by disinformation and to generate action. I mean, this information and false information is a, an extremely disturbing uh, issue uh, that we have to face every day uh, that generates among people, regular citizens, an enormous confusion and that confusion leads to inaction in a moment that 
we do need to be very proactive. Uh, personally, I think that uh, we have the instruments to do that as those interested in stopping any change also have the instruments to do that and an enormous amount of resources to carry on their plans. Uh, this is a particular technology and that why, that's why we have invited two of the speakers that are very knowledgeable on, the, on their technologies that has to do with internet, social media platforms and with artificial intelligence. And at the same time, this is a matter of defining policies on how to move forward, how to curb this, this information. And, uh, and for that, uh, we count on people that is dealing with the science communication and, uh, and defining policies that allow to try to balance this that is heavily imbalanced. Um, I would like to put the accent on the need of coming together in a proactive way, because personally, I think that uh, regulating the use of internet and particularly regulating the social media platforms is a very complex and probably much, it's a very complex issue and probably much slower than the urgency we are facing would require. I mean, the climate change issue is a very, very serious matter and, uh, and we need to, to act. And that's why we put, after the confusion, we put action. I mean, these social platforms are gigantic corporations. Mm -hmm. um, out of uh, the 10 main social platforms, eight are based in one country, which is the United States. And they are, in, in synthesis, the result of uh, the neoliberal globalization and uh, deregulation that still defines the world's governance at, I mean, at national and international levels. So that's a reality that is there. I, 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 I of course, support all the efforts to deal with it, this in terms of lobbying, of uh, political relations and so on. But I also strongly support and believe the need of action from the civil society side. Mm -hmm. I think that at the bottom line of the disinformation that we are considering in this workshop, there is a deep lack of communication. Mm -hmm. We live in the illusion that we are all very much communicated and that we have the privilege of living in a fully inform informed society. In my view, this is an illusion. I mean, we do live in bubbles organized by algorithms and uh, the communication is much oriented while at the same time, in my perception, there's a deep in communication between the north of the world and the south of the world. Probably most of us live in a situation where we receive global analysis. Within this globality, there's the local dimensions of which we often know very little, and particularly in that that we call the majority of the world or that you call the global south. At the same time, there's an enormous activity going on. I mean, despite the disinformation and the false news and the malinformation and all the amount of financial resources that are put on that, 
we've seen those of us concerned about the climate issue. We've seen that weak in terms of the possibility of action. Yet, youth generated this Fridays for Future mobilization that among different results produced one that is fundamental. Climate change is no longer an opinion, but fact. And a fact that calls for action. It's a kind of confrontation between David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. But this David's generated an, an enormous mobilization. And uh, that's the, the road that from the civil society side, uh, uh, I think we need to move forward. In this, we are people concentrated on communication and information. Uh, and this is what the citizens platform for climate change is. We have coincided in working together with UNESCO and uh, currently after very su successful webinars in June and July, we are moving forward to what we call the climate change communication convergence, which is coming all together to produce something that starts curving the disinformation uh, process. So this would be my introduction for now. Uh, and I would, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Banu Neupane. Uh, he's a program specialist uh, at UNESCO in the communication and information sector. He's a, science, a scientist and particularly concerned about science communication. So Banu, if you could please uh, come in. Thank, thank you, Ricardo. Um, indeed, the collaboration with IPS, uh, IP, IPS in this uh, sphere, and especially with Citizens Platform, has uh, produced some significant headway in curbing uh, climate change disinformation, as you just mentioned. Um, um, dear panelists and, uh, and participants, climate change refers to a change in the state of the climate that are characterized by changes in the mean and or the variability of its properties and that pers persists for an extended period. Such changes are long-term in nature and can lead to changes in the composition of the atmos atmosphere or in the land use. The impact of climate change have already begun to threaten the survival of humanity uh, through direct destruction of habitat, violent weather phenomena, reduction of uh, water, uh, water and food supplies. Right now, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here in Tampa and Tampa um, in, in Florida. And um, uh, we are in fact, that uh, there is a hurricane warning out there. Uh, it, it was raining until recently. So um, there, is, there is a state of chaos. The US is a very strong country and US has started to feel the burn of, uh, of climate change uh, and its realities. So let's think about, you know, the, the, the penury or, or, or the, the feviality of, of small countries in, in different parts of the world, you know, which are not as resource rich as, as US is. So in this sphere, human agency is directly concerned with and influenced by the climatic information. Accurate information about climate change is vital to take the right decision, understand impacts and take urgent actions to mitigate its ill effect. But disinformation or the falsehood designed to undermine the validity of scientific evidence permeates the sphere of climate change communication and information. Such false information may delay and even hinder urgent actions to respond to climate change. It is thus crucial that these questions are properly addressed. And you, we all know that um, like post COVID-19 pandemic, uh, renewed attention has been drawn to uh, informational problems. These informational problems and their detrimental impacts are fam familiar to actors work in the field of, uh, of, of climate change. During June through July, as, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, we had organized a set of four webinars to take the agenda forward. We had established uh, that there was urgent actions needed to establish or develop 
uh, develop monitoring and fact checking mechanism, support framework or governance based responses through law and policies. We had to uh, curate information through technological and economic responses. And also, and I think you know, it is the most important that we all bring all the stakeholders, uh, stakeholders together to normalize ethical and educational context to enable all concerned to assess the credibility of, uh, of the sources that are producing this, uh, uh, these information. The global narrative and these are shaped from both demand as well as supply side of information. The, the demand side requires that the correct information is generated for all stakeholders to connect with it. At the same time, supply side and uh, um, uh, needs to work in a better with the producers of information to curb the production of false information and prevent it spread or, or produce more true information. As you all know, um, like, uh, and th this, this was a recent uh, um, uh, statement that almost in you know, 60% of the total climate information is, uh, is uh, a Twitter is generated by machines. So our panel today is composed of uh, speakers representing technologies, climate activism, uh, transboundary water expert and communication expert. So before we begin this, uh, this, the, this discussion, I would like to invite our, our audience members to post any questions that you may have uh, so that uh, when the time will come, we'll either you know, give you the floor or you know, we will take, read out those questions for, for our panelists to, to respond to. To start the discussion, I would like to request our, our panelists to reflect from their experience on questions such as, uh, how does the in interplay between um, uh, systemic information campaigns, news, social media platform, etc., cetera, um, it, and its understandings uh, are, have a bearing on science and innovation. What are the, some of the strategies you know, that can be done? First, I would like to invite Dr. Martina Klein. She's a good friend who works uh, as an advisor for water and peace at the CIWI, where she is responsible for the water and peace portfolio in addition to advising on CIWI's acti activities and transboundary basins affected by water scarcity, political tension, and on violence. She has recently uh, turned her attention to, to, uh, to how targeted disinformation pose dangers and growing problem for transboundary water cooperation. And I think uh, you may have uh, uh, recently watched some of the videos uh, that she has posted on, on, on YouTube and also on her LinkedIn profile on, on how um, uh, disinformation can be dealt with a proper, uh, by bringing in a proper sphere of, uh, of cooperation. Martina, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Banu, and thank you everybody for a nice introduction. And I must say, I'm very happy that the Internet Governance Forum is looking into these issues related to climate change and disinformation, because as climate change, it really is one of the major concerns of our times. And I should say how I became first interested in disinformation and climate change and water cooperation. Uh, it was actually through a request we received by a government that we work with that's located in a region that really is hugely affected by water scarcity, political tensions and, and conflicts, armed conflicts. And they, the government said that we never received any, we don't know how to deal with the situation. We, are, we feel completely powerless. We are dealing with this very complex environmental situation. We know that it will be only worse and worse. We have uh, regions in our country which really have almost no access to water. And then we are constantly attacked by different information influence campaigns. And we don't know how to respond to the situation. And that really made us think how disinformation and or generally more information influence campaigns are also used in this transboundary setting or are targeted uh, at countries that uh, are affected by many other challenges. So for that, we decided we at CV, Stockholm International Water Institute, we actually look at this challenge from the position of these governments. What can we do? And when looking more into this issue, it is really about the space in which disinformation campaigns thrive. So it's really about what the governments can do to limit this environment in which um, information influence campaigns can be used. And it's about the really getting people's buy-in and increasing public awareness about the challenges to really uh, understand both uh, the importance of these issues and also the need for change. It's very difficult. You can think how difficult it is in 
uh, developed countries uh, to really change behavior. Maybe we should think about how, how do we use resources, uh, what food we buy, how, how do we behave. Just imagine how very different it can be in a country that's affected by many other challenges. And how do you, in this context, really encourage everybody? Now we also have to be considering the climate aspects and we also need to maybe change our behavior. We need to tell the farmers that maybe we cannot no longer really plant on planting wheat because that is a very water intense crop. Maybe we need to change to quinoa. So introducing all these changes in a very difficult countries, it's very complex. And of course, this offers an opportunity for many different actors to use information influence campaigns to further destabilize these countries. Uh, and I, I think we need to look, when thinking about disinformation and climate change, we really need to look at four different aspects. One is climate, what is really happening with climate change, climate variability. The other one is really the communication. How do we communicate it from the government? We see often there is a lack of transparency on different parts of the governance. We also see that there is a very low trust between governments and public. And now we can also see this, what happened with, uh, I think the COVID-19 pandemic really helped us to understand that there is just in some places very, very low trust in any information that the government shares. On, it's being questions, people say, I no longer believe in science. So really there, and that also stems from the fact that there is a very low trust between governments and public. That also contributes to the situation and environment in which disinformation thrive. And then we have politics. We see that there are groups that actively manipulate knowledge transfer. They abuse the power asymmetry. Uh, for example, we, we know that uh, we have technology that can, for example, predict droughts in a remote part of Africa. But how does this information get to the farmers and informs them that there will be drought? Of course, we also know that there is a lot of traditional knowledge that the farmers also rely on this, and that is also a very important aspect. But through modern technology, we can also use this and further advance their situation. However, the knowledge transfer about this is sometimes very slow and very weak. And then we have groups who abuse this, who use the situation because, who, uh, because of both the environmental degradation, but also lack of knowledge of the future developments to really advance their own political gains. So this can be in a situation in the regions, for example, different parts of Middle East are really affected by proxy wars. And wars are no, now fought not only by weapons, but, but, uh, but also by information. So you see a lot of different uh, groups that are really uh, trying to escalate situation in certain places by spreading either disinformation or really using the situation that, uh, for example, some groups of population do not trust the government, do not trust information that comes from the government and further abuse it to advance their own political gains. So it's really about the tactics to actively manipulate the knowledge transfer. And of course, then now we have a widely available social media. Uh, social media are available all across the globe, as you know. So this is really not, uh, so this is really not only a situation of countries in the West or uh, in developed countries, but really uh, the spread of information is extremely much, much faster in all parts of the globe. And this, of course, also makes it much easier to spread this information. And the last is data science. Uh, despite the advanced technology, we still have uh, data scarcity on, in some parts of uh, the more uh, fragile countries. We also have lack of understanding of data and we have low scientific literacy among some decision makers. And this is really on part of the scientists. How do we communicate about these uh, uh, incoming challenges? Uh, often we, we, and I think that this is that organizations like CV, but also organizations by, like UNESCO and the citizen platform can really play a very key role into transferring these very complex scientific messages uh, into something that the decision makers can really work with. And this is very important to help the decision makers know how to use science and how science can be their friend. How to use information and data to really 
argue for need to change politics. Uh, it, we will see that, uh, uh, and this is, I think I will end with this, uh, just imagine in some parts of the world, it's very challenging to make decisions uh, that will really uh, affect public behavior. It's very difficult to, uh, to challenge them to really start, for example, uh, saving water in certain way, when they finally can maybe afford a solar panel to have their own well, when there's just the, the general system is not working to really pass the message to these people. But you also need to think about uh, water sustainability. You cannot just pump as you like. So really to, to send these messages in a way that the citizens would trust it, and that it was trust that this is really in the interest of the future of their countries. So these uh, four aspects are extremely important. Climate, what is happening with climate change? How do we communicate about it? How is, what, what about the low trust between the government and public? The politics, who is really abusing the situation? Who is taking advantage of this? And how do we use data? How can we use data better? How can we use science better? Uh, and I will end with this. I think that uh, the knowledge is already here. It's just not equally distributed. So we really need to uh, make an effort how to get uh, the right information to the people who need it and how to empower governments who have mandates to make a change that would minimize the space in which disinformation campaigns thrive. You're muted. Yeah, yes, I, I think yeah. I, I, I used my four minutes, three to four minutes, uh, yeah. but I'm very happy to, of course, answer to other questions. I'm, I'm happy. I have some, I have a slide with examples of disinformation campaigns in the context of transboundary waters. So I can really show you specific examples and I can tell you how it affected certain processes. But uh, I thought that we, we can do it in the second part of this, but uh, Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Perfect, Martina. This introduction has been perfect. It's extremely interesting. And myself, I already have like some questions to put to you and, and I look forward to seeing also those slides that would illustrate it better. Uh, we move forward. I would like to introduce now to uh, Mr. Asher Means. Asher, besides being a friend, uh, is a partner. We are working together. Uh, uh, he's the executive director of the Tyndall Center for Climate uh, Research Center for Climate Change. It's uh, this year the Tyndall Center is celebrating its 20th anniversary. So it's 20 years working on climate change issues. And um, Asher, as the its executive director and as a science communicator, because that's his. Uh, know-how is uh, much into all the issues of how science is communicated. I mean, the difficulties, the flaws in, in science communication, and at the same time with how to deal with the rejection of science, the disinformation, the false information, trying to uh, uh, curb or to isolate what science has been teaching us about this specific issue. So um, I would like to Asha to tell us about. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And uh, thank you to, uh, well, nice to be here in this panel and also to uh, people out there in the um, in the internet sphere. Um, so exactly as Ricardo said, so I've been communicating climate change for well 20 years since the founding of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. And to use Bano's, ter uh, Bano's terminology, I guess I'm, you know, I'm one of the delivery the, or the supplier people. So I said we, we tend to supply the latest knowledge, the research, the commentary, uh, the, 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 the policy intervention ideas and it's my job to help our researchers get their very useful information to where it is that their useful information is, is supposed to be. Um, however, that just sounds like a pipeline of, of delivering information. Uh, the communication of climate change is really all about dialogue and that's where uh, the internet has something very different 
to traditional media, which is that it can be a lot more interactive. However, we do know from you know, lots of research um, that traditional media is still where people get information about climate change from and most of their, most of their, their news from. Um, so the, the, yeah, the internet and, and traditional media, albeit traditional media online, um, are serve slightly different purposes. And I think some of that also is about um, not only the, the news gathering abilities of, of traditional media, um, but also sort of trust in source as well. And I think as exactly um, as Martina was saying there is um, trust in source is how all of us all the time evaluate information because we can't possibly be an expert in absolutely everything. So mostly we look, as does the public, but we are the public, we look to see where information is coming from. If we trust that source of information, that's generally the information that we will be, we, be taking and talking to our fr friends and, and, and family about, all to do with our, our values less than the, the information ourselves. And of course, that's exactly where the internet has an enormous melee um, of how do people trust information that's uh, on the internet versus uh, provided by a, a, a traditional media, which for right or wrong, um, is supposed to have some quite um, professional journalistic norms. Now that might not always be the case, but that's, that, that's, that's the theory. But I think before we get too worried about misinformation and disinformation about climate change, we really have to remember how hugely successful the communication of climate change has been. Um, as I said, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm not trying to claim this as, as, as my success at all. But when I started, nobody knew anything about climate change. Maybe some governments were interested. I'd maybe get invited to a village hall to talk to some farmers about how the climate was changing or something. Um, you know, now it is this big, big public policy issue. We're here talking about it. We had the Paris Agreement of 2015. Next year will be the Glasgow UN summit as a follow up to Paris. Um, yeah, we, we can see it all around us. We, we, we hear it um, all the time. Information about climate change. So there is certainly no deficit of information about climate change. It has been uh, you know, remarkable um, in, uh, in engaging policy and, and public with, uh, with a, an issue of our, our day. Now, the one interesting thing or an interesting thing I think about the um, the internet and sort of internet governance is that the internet is probably still wide open in terms of engaging people with climate change. People on the internet are already interested in climate change. They're looking for information in climate change. And most information about climate change on the internet is not very good quality. And I will hold up my hand and say, well, that's true of my organization as well. Um, it isn't an easy topic to uh, to communicate well. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a huge topic. There's many different types of audiences for information about, about climate change. And so um, no, nobody's got it worked out on the internet as, uh, yet. You know, the inter communication of climate change on the internet is, is still um, very much a, a work in progress and is still um, taking baby steps. Um, it's not, not at all grown up yet. Um, and that's something that the, you know, the citizens platform is, is um, hoping, uh, trying to help with. Um, and my second sort of caution about having said about the communication climate change hugely successful overall is also um, in terms of misinformation, disinformation, that we must remember that most people are not out there at the extremes of the bell curve. You know, they're, they're not right at the end. The majority of people, they're here in the middle. And though that's the people that, um, uh, that are being engaged with and talk about climate change, don't worry too much about the people out at the extremes. They're, um, they're, they can be very influential and they need um, quite specific ways of dealing with and in, engaging them. But you know, heart, most people's hearts and minds, they're, they're in, in the middle not not out there and one of the 
One of the worries about uh, misinformation and disinformation is often it's not about the information itself, it's about this erosion of trust in scientific evidence. So we, we've talked about trust already, trust in source. Um, and misinformation and disinformation often hasn't got anything to do with the actual information about climate change. Um, they're actually trying to ask questions um, to, to erode trust in where that information comes from, as that's because that's how we we um, that's how we evaluate information that we're not expert in. Um, we wait and see, and I've I've not actually looked at this yet, really. But of course, COVID has really brought science back to the top of public interest in every country in the world, and so. Um, uh, wait and see or at least I haven't looked yet to see um, you know what how that's changed if at all how people are thinking about science um, and what science can do for society um, which is different from what um, governments say about science so there's there are two very specific things science from the from the scientists from the experts and then um, and then information mediated through uh, through, through, through governments and others, and certainly towards the beginning or the the, the, the beginning of the pandemic and going on, and perhaps it's a bit less now. Um, I was really um, I don't know about surprised, but I couldn't help but note all of the different sorts of pundits, none of which had any qualifications whatsoever, um, comment on in, commenting on and disputing about numbers and, and policy choices. You know, journalists random people on Twitter, um, all sorts of things, sort of putting their their opinion out there, um, some of which were very big audiences, you know, some of which are actually um, ex-presidents of, of, of a major global, comp uh, global uh, countries, um, you know, just basically um, giving their opinion as if it has the same value as as um, as experts, um, and so we'll have to yeah we'll we'll have to look to see um, how trust in science currently stands. Trust in science is always high. I'm going to imagine it's gone higher, but I, I could be wrong. I just wanted to finish with um sort of just four very quick lessons or think around anything that we're doing around communicating climate change, misinformation, disinformation. Um, I, I communicate for climate change, I, I, I teach it a little bit, and so these are sort of some of my hard one, one lessons, but these are actually all rooted in theory as well. Um, so, I mean, the first one is don't amplify misinformation or disinformation. Um, it's too easy to argue back, and but what you actually do when you're arguing back is often you then amplify that information to an audience that didn't see that information to, to, to begin with. So, um, you know, starve, starve misinformation or disinformation from the oxygen of, of publicity um, is, is an ideal thing to do. Um, yeah, it's interesting when we look at tr Trump's tweets, you know, the fact that Trump's tweets now get marked as this tweet might not be true, um, is the fact checking actually now makes a news story. So that's you know, a million people now alerted to the fact that what somebody said wasn't true but they didn't know they didn't read they're not following trump's twitter feed to begin with um so there's 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 there's, there's something in there so um starve starve of the oxygen of publicity um taking responsibility for how how we are heard is completely different from what it is that we think we said um and there we're talking about things like cognitive bias whereby we're all accumulating the information that supports our worldview um and, and uh, similarly with values and we can absolutely work with that and you i was talking a little about the a bit about the extremes you can work with that you can work with values you can work with cognitive bias um certainly when you're um dealing with the extremes but also when you're 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 working with everybody else as well and pay attention to psychological distance which is that climate change seems far far away in the future happening to somebody in a distant land that's really not the case anymore it's, it's happening near near and here and now so we don't have to talk about climate as as, as, a, as, as a as a future thing it's a now thing um and uh, and just to reinforce around um working with 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 people's values um it's not just about information, fact. Is this a good fact? Is this a bad fact? Are these numbers good? Are these numbers bad? Um, is this been interpreted correctly? Um, working with people's values, um, 
sort of gets us around around a lot of those those issues. I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much for, for listening and I look forward to hearing the other uh, panelists and your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Asar. Um, in fact, uh, you raised a very interesting uh, points that trust definitely is an issue. And it uh, essentially reminds me of two studies uh, uh, which were published in earlier this year, one by Brown University, which actually established that 25% of the all tweets uh, that was uh, generated around climate change were generated by bots. And um, they were not in a human, uh, there was not at all any human intervention in generating those bots. The other thing is John Hopkins uh, also published in another um, uh, study and they actually went and evaluated um, to what extent uh, the information on the, on, the, on, the, on the cyberspace right now um, related to COVID-19 is based on the fact or quote unquote fiction. And their finding was also you know, very, very, very interesting. So it looks like, you know, like our lives are slowly being, like, uh, being, being determined and kind of you know, guided uh, by the kind of technology that we, are surrounded ourselves with. Uh, so uh, to discuss you know, this thing, I, we have got uh, Marco Gorbelik uh, um, uh, with us. He's a researcher in the field of artificial intelligence. His focused area of expertise are machine learning, data text, web mining, uh, network analysis, semantic technology, and deep text understanding and data visualization. Marco co-leads International Intelligence Lab at Joseph Stefan Institute. He uh, contributed to uh, the establishment of UNESCO's uh, so Category 2 Center on Artificial Intelligence, uh, in International Research Center on, on AI. Uh, recently, it was it, it yet to be inaugurated, but it has been confirmed by by both you know UNESCO as well as Slovenia as the new uh, category two center. He's also uh, uh, the CEO of Quintelligence.com, uh, and he specializes in uh, in solving complex AI tasks for the com commercial world. He collaborates with major European academy institution and does uh, quite a lot of work. Um, um, Marco is co-author of several books and he has founded uh, several startups. Um, so uh, one of the things you know, that I must uh, say is, you know, in 2016, Marco became digital champion of Slovenia uh, at European Commission level. So uh, with, with that, Marco, the floor is yours. You are muted. So can you please you know, unmute yourself and uh, provide your view on how, how, what can technology do to, to set light on, uh, on this and bring some trust in, in the current sphere of uh, climate change disinformation. Thank you. Yeah, Banu, thanks. Yeah, yeah this was a too long CV uh, to read, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm <clears throat> coming from the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, what we do a lot is uh, dealing uh, with information and uh, uh, understanding this information flows. Uh, so uh, I prepared a couple of slides. Maybe um, if some slides will be shown afterwards, maybe I can show mine uh, now. Um, uh, let me just uh, take the screen. Uh, uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, maybe just uh, to start, right? Uh, 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 so what I'm showing here is a live picture of uh, uh, information on climate change as it's being published uh, in recent minutes or hours, right, uh, uh, across the world, right? So uh, the actual information flow is even faster than what you see. But this is like something which is happening right now on, uh, on the topic of climate change. Might be proper information, might be disinformation, we don't know, right? But this is, you see, it appears in all the languages, right? Uh, Chinese, Arabic, uh, and many others, right? So this is, uh, so we have pretty much good uh, sense of uh, uh, who is talking what. This is mainstream media, this is not social media, right? But uh, still, uh, uh, just to give you a sense uh, what's happening at the moment, right? Okay, now let's, uh, now uh, it's not, but it's not just about collecting information and understanding, uh, uh, it's trying to, we, we need to understand uh, 
well, the content, but not just the content, but also uh, dynamics of, uh, uh, of uh, information spread so that we can actually react, steer and guide towards, well, uh, information which we would like to pursue. Uh, okay, what's the ecosystem which we talk about when we talk about disinformation uh, or misinformation or even proper information, right? So on one, first we have, okay, social media, which we touched already. What are the key features of social media? It's fast spreading, mostly no context, which provides good ground for manipulation, right? And um, prone to this echo chamber effect. Why it's prone to echo chamber effect? Because typically social media is run by big companies and they optimize their business goals, KPIs, and somehow these KPIs usually are uh, higher if uh, you create echo chambers and people, well, seem to be happier on the short term, right? So this is social media. Then we have blocks. These are usually a little bit longer documents, right? Uh, can be influential. It's kind of not as fast as social media. It's more like medium speed. No editorial, so this is again issue where we, uh, which uh, allows manipulation, and usually this would be more like compact social circles. Um, mainstream media, again, kind of medium speed, editorial, higher trust, and broader social circles generally. And then we have in this ecosystem also research papers, which are much slower, right? Peer reviewed, high trust but very small social circles, right? So this is right the ecosystem which we uh, talk about. And um, why I'm mentioning this, because uh, this um, uh, uh, later I will uh, uh, touch the, the point uh, why, why we need the data, right? If we want to steer the discussion. Now, uh, one key issue is to understand how information spreads, right? And how echo chambers appear. I will show now just uh, one, uh, few seconds of video. Uh, uh, so how an information uh, spreads from uh, mainstream media uh, towards uh, social media. You see, this is in the center is one um, uh, New York Times article. And this is now every circle is one hour and how social media picks up information from one single New York Times article. And each line which you see here is basically one opinion line. Yeah? So, uh, so this is uh, so this is how uh, information spreads, right? The point is to catch this information, to understand the dynamics, where it goes, and to steer it in the right uh, direction. Here on the right, I won't show the second video, but here on the right side, you would see the, these clusters, which are basically echo chambers at the end, right? So it's. Uh, uh, everybody within this echo chamber is more or less convincing each other about the same thing, right? While they don't have really good contact with others. Now, the point is how to break this echo chamber so that uh, 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 we don't get these isolated uh, uh, things. Now, uh, just one small comics, which maybe you've seen it, maybe not, I really like it. Uh, so how social influence works, right? So there's a guy staring up, right? Uh, and then a few more come, they all are staring up, still not clear really what's happening there, right? The lady spots them, uh, they're all staring up. So she starts staring up as well, right? While the angel on the top, right, spots all these people all staring up. So he should know, I guess, right? But no, eventually he also starts uh, staring up, right? So this is how this uh, media uh, uh, and these echo chambers work, right? Nobody really understands why everybody's staring up at the end, right? Uh, uh, so uh, now just to conclude, uh, uh, there were a couple of these key policy questions which we uh, touched, uh, uh, which, which were in the opening text. Uh, I just uh, wanted to touch some of them, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, some uh, address some of the issues, right? So how are this, uh, uh, the, the first question is how the ex are existing and emerging digital technologies being used to facilitate production and dissemination of this information about climate change. So today's technology, like social media certainly increase speed of information. I mean, this is something as compared to like 10, 20 years ago, the information speed spread is much faster. 
And the goal, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, are uh, the effect are these echo chambers, which are mostly aligned with, uh, with the business goals of uh, companies which are running this. Uh, this dynamics, which is happening in these echo chambers, certainly accelerates public polarization and causes people to be more resistant to change their beliefs as well, right? So this is what we are fighting, really, right? So as long as we can change people's beliefs, it's fine. But uh, if we have uh, the whole media space stuck in a state where we cannot change them, then we, we cannot win, right? Uh, and um, as we see, the future technologies won't really automate critical thinking in the near future. So we will be there for at least 10 more years, I, I would say, right? And well, climate ch change topic is just one of these many victims of the same principles. COVID discussions, as Bano was saying, the same thing, right? Uh, so how to combat uh, this disinformation, right? Uh, so here on the right side, I, I put this one graph. So I'm dealing with AI, right? So AI is really about complex systems, how to deal with complex systems. And information space is a complex system. Uh, now uh, we see this uh, public opinion being just one type of a complex system which you can steer if you have the right tools, right? And uh, so here, the point is, so if this small circle here is public opinion and we want to bring it from here to here, we just need to find the right tools, the right mechanisms being applied at the right time. So this is pretty much how marketing works, how psychology, how many other uh, things are working. And the same thing is here, right? So uh, to achieve this, right? To be in a position to even start systematically influencing, first we need to have a proper landscape of the origin of information and also um, uh, how this information uh, is uh, spreading. So without this, everything is just a guessing, right? So this is systematic approach. And uh, next step, right? These operators, these actions are basically should be psychologically, pedagogically, or scientifically uh, founded, right? Um, uh, to to boost the trust. And just the last slide. Uh, uh, so uh, the question was, what sort of policies or regulations could be formulated, right? So let's say three fact checking at the moment. These are this is really short term thing. Uh, what we can do, right? Still mostly manually done by experts. Then breaking echo chambers. This is more like a midterm goal and cannot be done without the help of social media companies. Whatever we do, we cannot do this if uh, Facebook uh, or Twitter or others are not uh, uh, cooperating, right? And structured education. This is more like long-term goal, right? Uh, and uh, okay, here are a couple of uh, other recommendations maybe which uh, uh, we don't need to go to into details. So much from my side, uh, more like from uh, technological side, how to operate with uh, public opinion and uh, climate awareness about climate change is just one of these public opinion uh, topics, important ones, but just one of them. Thanks. Well, thanks to you, uh, Marco. Thank you very much for this uh, so detailed uh, um, exposition of how things are working, uh, which is fundamental to, to learn how to move on and to define our own policies. No? This is what we are trying to do from the citizens platform, including, and with this with the specific support uh, of UNESCO, we, have just, uh, we are just starting to build a tool to be able to track uh, specific uh, this information or false information in some social media, particularly in Twitter, um, uh, because that would be uh, give place to analysis and to outputs to be disseminated among the people. And this is one of the roles of uh, the citizens platform that have been created by journalists, uh, artists uh, uh, in synergy with uh, scientists and experts and uh, and that moves to this uh, convergence I mentioned before. Um, linked to this, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Fabian Sibnert uh, because we are working together and particularly in, in building this uh, tool. 
Um, he's the co-founder and the head of analytics of a communications company called Ancord, that is based in, in Stockholm. And um, Fabian is an expert in communication assessment uh, fund, founded on, in, in data analysis. And he's a former researcher and contributed, contributed at the University of Oxford, the Oxford Internet Institute and Chatham House. So um, as an expert on these matters, uh, I would like uh, Fabian to, to speak. And Thank you so much, Ricardo. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. And of course, uh, we're obviously delighted to be here and chat with you all today. And I think that a special thanks to Bono and UNESCO, as well as, of course, Ricardo of the, of the Citizens Platform. And, uh, and of course, every other distinguished panelist who have spoken, it's, it's incredibly interesting to, to be here and share all the insights and, uh, and understand what we're all thinking. And, and obviously, and most fundamentally, of course, all everyone is here listening today. Think that that is obviously one of the keys to spreading this information that we have here today. Uh, as Ricardo said, so my name is Fabian Sibner. I'm head of analytics of a next-gen strategic communication firm called Anchored, uh, fundamentally founded on the principles that data and strategy go hand in hand. Those are two fundamental aspects that we need to control in order to be able to communicate in a better way. Uh, so my purpose here today is speaking a little bit more from the technology side, but also on a methodolo methodological side of understanding how we can really approach these things. Uh, and obviously, as Ricardo mentioned a little bit, so we are currently working with the Citizens Platform of developing a scientific methodological approach to how to assess and track fake news or in disinformation, specifically focusing right now on Twitter. Uh, the research and, methodolo and methodology that we're working with uh, came about when I was a graduate student at the University of Oxford and working specifically with the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, focusing on trying to track this. Uh, and I think that this comes very naturally to one of the things that Marco said is that we're, we're, we're in right now in of a short term looking, we, we need to try to start tracking these things so we can, uh, we can start making an impact on, especially on the three questions that we've been discussing about. And in essence, not to be too long or too detailed, I think that what we're trying to produce is a, is a three-step process. And obviously number one is gonna to be to identify disinformation and fake news. And how would we go about doing this? It's obviously a function of, do you go pure AI? So you let computers and algorithms do everything, or do you combine humans? And, and, and we are of the fundamental understanding that right now we need both. We need artificial intelligence to track the major conversations, but this needs to be informed by humans that can understand the nuances, that can understand the difference between sarcasm and humor and fact. So it's very important for us to include people in our processes of trying to understand this, uh, which means that we're getting to data plus experience. Uh, in the next step, one, once we'd have identified, let's say, the big bad wolf of sharing and spreading fake information, we obviously need to track them because simply identifying them is insufficient. We need to understand what they're saying, how frequently are they posting, what are they posting about, which regions are they focusing on. We need to gather information on them. Uh, and once we have that, we obviously need to start trying to combat it but we combat it by knowing the data, knowing what they're focusing on, knowing what they are trying to target. So really addressing kind of like the three questions that was addressed originally in the, in, in the seminar, like emerging technologies, how is that using to, to, to further fake news and how can we combat it? And then which policies can we use to, uh, to try to hinder it? So from our perspective, uh, we can't address part three policies without first dealing with one and two. We need data to inform policies and data without insights is gonna be useless and insights without data is gonna be pointless. We need both data and insights. And that is the fundamental thing that I think that we all are speaking about here today is that we need information, data to then inform policies. And that is exactly what we are trying to work with with Citizens Platform right now. 
Uh, and I think that rather than just carrying on too long here, I can happily just, just end there for now so we can take some, some questions from the audience as well. You're muted, Ricardo. Well, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Fabian. I, I really um, like uh, your, your, the, the statement that you, uh, that you used. You know, it's a data with insight is in what we are looking for. Um, that actually brings us to a very, some, some very interesting questions. You know, I see that you know, there are a couple of questions have been asked and uh, they are primarily you know, geared to, uh, to Martina. Uh, Martina, if you read those questions and maybe try to, uh, to, to, to respond to that. And after that, you know, I've got one question for, for, for Marco and the other one for Fabian. So Ricardo and I you know, will take turns in asking uh, you questions. So, but this one, you know, which has come from the audience, you know, which um, is pretty much, you know, like at, uh, in your comfort zone, uh, Martina. Uh, I see, is the, is the question about the conflict resolution and transboundary water cooperation? So I will try to quickly answer that. And uh, Alexandru, you are very welcome to reach out to me afterwards uh, if you would like to know more, because I understand that this is not an event focused on transboundary water collaboration. But I will also try to, in my answer, say a little bit how disinformation and information influence campaigns in general affect these processes. So to really put it a little bit in our context. So for uh, you may know that there is a 310 transboundary basins across the world. That means that it's a, uh, rivers that are being shared by two or more countries and it's more than half of the world's population that's dependent on fresh water from these uh, rivers, transboundary rivers, and the most of the, I think over 60% of them, they lack any form of agreement how to manage these waters. And then what we have, the framework, it's really international water law. And that's quite complex, as, as you know, in international law, there is no higher arbiter. So we have basic principles like duty to cooperate, you cannot cause significant harm, and also you have a reasonable and equitable use of water, but it's really about the countries to find, uh, they have to find a common agreement and it really needs to be owned by all countries that share a particular river basin. Of course, in some river basins that are not really so challenged geopolitically, it's really much more matter of fact, it's more a technical discussion, but then in the most famous difficult basins like the Nile, Euphrates and Tigris, Jordan, we also have Mekong, uh, uh, also very famous agreement, we have an Indus Basin between India and Pakistan, it's really then all other issues come into play and that's where information is so important. What we see is often these countries, when we look into these water disputes, they are actually not in agreement what is the main challenge for the basin, what is the main challenge challenge from a region. They don't trust each other's data. They don't trust, the, for example, how is the water use? What will, how will the future look? We have a lot of uncertainty. Even there where we have agreements, we don't actually know how much water availability and water demands we will have because we have a uh, because of climate change, we have less water in the system and we also have growing population. So we have higher demand. We need more water. We have uh, more complex societies. We need more water for agriculture. We need more water for industries. And we are still not yet very good at using new technology, how to be more uh, efficient in our water use. So it's really data and information is extremely important. And often this is actually abused. There is a lot of disinformation being spread. For example, in upstream countries, there is a, uh, those who would like to maybe find an agreement. There is a lot of public opposition because in generally, there is a very low awareness about the principles of international water law. I admit it's really not a very popular subject, but to really explain the general population that maybe it is in our interest to find an agreement with our neighbors, how we can jointly govern these shared water resources, and then we will all have enough water. And it will be better for the whole region when we can really think of sustainable policies. So there we really we work with information and public awareness about these processes, and also public awareness about upcoming challenges. And we also work with the information that, of course, the policy, uh, policy makers have. Often in transboundary basin, it's, it's all negotiation in any context. It's an art of compromise. And imagine if you have a whole public against you. And we've seen cases, for example, in the Euphrates and Tigris, then uh, uh, the previous water minister from uh, Iraq would go to negotiate with Turkey. 
uh, he was often subjected to information influence campaigns. There were specific disinformation campaigns focused on him, that it was extremely difficult to reach any type of compromise with the upstream country because there were accusation, incorrect accusations that he had secret bank account in Turkey, for example, at the range from um, all different types of uh, information. And it was that he's selling our water and this spread very fast. So then it was very difficult in that type of climate to really come up to any kind of uh, solution. We also have, uh, there is a, you know, uh, the whole situation between, uh, in the Nile, between Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan about the GERD. There is a lot of, uh, different disinformation campaigns floating about that situation. So it's really about, uh, yes, uh, the information that we have available for the policymakers, information that is available for the public, and some information that public can trust. And if we improve this, it would significantly help us to uh, achieve some shared uh, solutions for these very complex challenges. I think I will stop here on this issue because uh, it's much more complex on the human right. I can only say that human right to water, it's an individual right. And then historical water rights that would refer more to rights of countries. So these two are different things. There is a special, of course, uh, there is a special law on human right to water. It even says how many liters individual person is entitled. It changes uh, if you, for example, are based in IDP camp, uh, your daily need is lower than if you are in, in a normal situation. But uh, I, I should say that this is really, uh, this is a little bit a different topic. So please do reach out to me if you would like to learn more about this. Thank you very much, Martina. Uh, we've been warned that time is almost due. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question for Fabian uh, Sidnet. I see that. I, I, I don't know if you read it, Fabian. Yeah, no, I did. Could you? Could you? Uh, no, I'll, I'll happily answer it uh, briefly in terms of. I think that the way that we approach data, in, in specifically in the in in what we're doing with Citizens Platform, is that we're focusing on not the, the, the tweets themselves, but rather the information that they're trying to share, specifically focusing on URLs. So when we get the data itself, we treat it as neutral. We don't treat it as negative or positive, but then when we assess each individual uh, URL, which is done through human coding, we must then assess whether or not the information is trying to express positive sentiments, negative sentiments, neutral sentiments, fake, or correct. So I think that we treat it originally as neutral and then based on understanding and expertise from humans, we then assess it based off of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I just had a very small question to, to Asher. Um, Asher, do you think it is more crucial to target malicious actors who produce false information or social media sites uh, which are, are maybe unwittingly disseminating you know, false in information. So which do you think you know, we, should, we should act uh, or you know, ad address first? Um, from my perspective of somebody who deals with the research and the new knowledge, then it would, then it would be the actors rather than, rather than social media. I mean, I would, I would argue that you've got, um, ignoring bots, you, you, you've got influencers. And so those thought leaders tend to be the influencers that then obviously oft, often set, set the, the pattern. So that's not to say ignore social media. Um, I think for me also, it's a question of resources. Where do I put my effort? And so I, if something's wrong or incorrect or misunderstood, then I'll probably put my effort on the um, influencer rather than sort of the, the, the mass everybody. Thank you, Asha. Uh, uh, did you have a question for Marco, you said? Yes, or? I have a question for Marco. Um, see, if um, bots can um, spread disinformation, why can't bots be utilized to spread, uh, say, correct information? Well, why you know, the, the bad guys are winning the race on, on this thing, which I uh, don't understand is there anything you know that you can you know add uh, yeah so uh, certainly we, we can make bots which would spread positive information as well right the, 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 this is no problem not sure if we want to do this because this seems like uh, 
polluting the information space, right? Um, th this is maybe one comment to this. Um, uh, that's why I was putting on my slides this item that uh, social media co companies need to cooperate, right? For them, it's way easier to spot uh, to spot and block the bots as we, I mean, we cannot stop them, right? We can just uh, fight in the same way, but uh, not sure if we want to really uh, put ourselves, ourselves to that level, right? To, uh, uh, you know, uh, to send our bots. We can, yeah, we can, no problem. But uh, maybe even, you know, uh, it would be cheaper to, to pay the same people which are uh, creating these other bots. I mean, to create the, our bots as well it would be probably cheaper than we would do them. Yeah? I mean, just economically speaking, right? Uh, but uh, not sure if we want to do this because it's really pollution, information pollution. Uh, uh, but without without cooperation of social media companies, it's really hard uh, to win this battle on uh, with bots, right? Um, I would like to comment on that. That is personally, I think that it's uh, social media companies cooperation is a, is a is a difficult thing. Uh, we just have five more minutes, uh, but briefly, um, if we have created citizens platform, we do believe in the power of proper information and that uh, uh, with that proper information, I mean, super accurate information, plus adding, reporting what a lot of people is currently doing, uh, implementing worldwide regarding climate change and sustainable development, uh, should be enough, if properly organized, to curve the disinformation. The point is that uh, we are an enormous amount of sources of information, of organizations and people concerned about the climate change and how to start building a different par paradigm because this is the bottom line of all this. I mean, we grow in, in, a, in, a, in a paradigm, we moved in a paradigm that has been um, installed there. And to change the current affairs, we need to start introducing other kind of considerations. Now, this spread of sources here and there, here and there, I mean, the point is to try to come together and not, not competing, because there's no need to compete or it makes no sense to compete. And that's why with UNESCO we started talking about a convergence, a communications convergence. I mean, adding resources, adding know-how to produce constantly, and you need quality and quantity. And, uh, and, uh, and that's the way that we believe we have to move forward in a context well, you don't only have internet and social media. You have traditional media, you have advertisements agencies, and that apart from those that most of us are able to consult, the enormous amount of media worldwide is producing superficial information, no follow-up, no analysis, no linking one thing to the other. And so this is part of the disinformation, let's say, more than, than, than false news. Uh, so um, with this, I would like to say if someone else has any other comment, uh, uh, otherwise the, our time is over, the time for the work. No, no, we, we, have got, uh, we have got one small thing to request everyone. If you think that, you know, uh, because we still have you know, about three minutes, please take, you know, like 20 seconds to say what, uh, do you want UNESCO as well as, you know, uh, maybe a uh, citizen's platform uh, and maybe, you know, CV and all of us, you know, like do together, just, you know, one statement and you know, something, you know, that we can, you know, essentially, you know, provide as a recommendation of this, uh, this, this panel discussion. So maybe, you know, we'll start from you, Martina, and then, you know, we'll go around uh, in the same. Just one I statement. I just would like to add to what 
Ricardo said is that often in the regions where we work, it's because people do not trust governments, but they trust people they know. And that's why they listen to social media, because that is a mean how to communicate with people they know. So if something is forwarded by a friend, one in certain regions, one doesn't question it because one trusts that person. And that is really being abused, how, this, how the disinformation spreads, because there is ultimately no trust in government, but there is a lot of trust in like your private relations and social media is just means for spreading this. And uh, as a wish, it's a very good question. And I'm, I must say that CV is really very much looking forward to continue working with UNESCO and citizen platform on this. And we would really like to see how we can better communicate science at uh, all different, how, what we can do, how we can just better share these messages and minimize the space for this information campaign. Yes, Asher, time is running at 20 seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree quite a lot with what Martina was just saying, actually, is um, it's, all, it's all to do with trust in source, whether it's um, personal relationships, your friends at the dinner table, um, on Twitter or, or, or other social media, um, but we should certainly be aware, as um, I think Marco was saying, it, it, this is always all within a bubble, um, and so it's actually about um, talking outside outside of the bubbles, especially with social media. Marco, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, my my message is just we shouldn't be we shouldn't be naive, right? So uh, and we should fight this discussion with the same or even stronger tools as are being used for misinformation. So we shouldn't be naive. Uh, it's fine, citizen platform or anything else, we should optimize the reach and the impact, right? This is the KPI which we need to optimize, Not, nothing else, right? Guardian, <laughs> the final point. Uh yeah, no, I think that one of the things that is key here from our perspective is that we need to make sure that anything that we talk about, make sure that it is in some way, shape or form supported by facts. Uh, try to provide data if you can. Uh, try to also follow, as we've been mentioning here, influencers or key individuals who are informing the narrative in a positive sense. Try to keep them engaged. Try to be, be there and support them as much as you can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ricardo, uh, from thank Ricardo you. and myself, you know, we are signing out. And thank you so much, you know, panelists, and you've been so nice and so to the point and, uh, and precise. We'll prepare a report and we'll share it with you. And then this recording, I think, will be available. Everything is also um, transcribed, so we can also utilize that uh, for, for, for our report or, you know, for, for, uh, for preparing the news item. Yeah, thank you very much to each one of you, and thanks to the uh, in Internet Governance Forum for giving us this opportunity. I feel this just like uh, adding and uh, the parting point again on which we should continue in contact and working together. Martina, I Bye. take the word and I will contact you quickly. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Banu. Goodbye. Bye.